welcome to episode one of Euphoria. This is going to be a show about all things Europe. Now, I have the pleasure of being joined by one of the greatest Western League of Legends players of all time, Deficio. Hello, everyone. Also, Perks is here. Sorry. Hey <laughs> Hi, folks. <laughs> All right, so just to give everybody a heads up on what we're going to be talking about today, we've got some meta discussion planned. We're going to be talking about G2, our guest himself, Perks, not Deficio, luckily, and then we'll have a couple special segments that we're going to be doing every week. Uh, those are overhyped and underrated. We'll be talking about the most overhyped and underrated things in the European LCS, whether that's teams, champions, whatever, EU LCS power rankings, and we'll round it all out with some quick fire predictions. Just a couple seconds to think about it. Nothing fancy, just grinding through it. Uh, so the first thing, we're going to jump right into it, is overhyped and underrated. So this week we're going to be doing teams. We're going to be talking about who is the most overhyped, who is the most uh, underrated. And Luca, I know you already have one ready. Who is the most overhyped or underrated? Who would you pick to talk about? I mean, I actually don't have one ready yet, but I think if I was up to me, the most overhyped team is probably uh, Fnatic. Ooh, okay, all right. Uh, just because Fnatic has such a big brand, uh, big fan base, uh, likable players, and they've been together for a while. So as much as they are kind of overhyped by the Fnatic fans, they're still going to be a good team in some time. But right now, they're pretty overhyped, and especially their bot lane is getting really overhyped by the mm. by the whole community. And I, I don't know about the analysts because I didn't hear, but the whole community is really overhyping the bot lane. Do you think uh, they're going to be better with Hillisang instead of Jesses, or are they going to be worse? Um, I think that they could be, I mean, it's very hard to say, but they could be better in a like, very long run if they can like tame Hillisang, like, kind of, because Hillisang is like this, like, like this beast that like, can just go off, you know, and he can sometimes like, just carry you a game, or he can sometimes like, um, not carry you a game. <laughs> but uh, from what we've seen last week, he's been more of like, He's been kind of tamed, you know, like he built Ardent Sensor on Rakan instead of Righteous Glory, which is like... True, which is bad, which, by the way, don't do yeah, that. Yeah, which is, <laughs> which, is not, which is not good, but it's like, it's a, like a, a sign he's like unleashed, you know? <laughs> like he has to buy... Like, buff me yeah, up like he has to buy the Sensor. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think the biggest question mark is Botlin right now. Yeah, I actually think, um, I said this in our preseason thing that... Yeah. Had horrible audio. Hopefully but not this time. Maybe good audio. <laughs> this time good audio. But uh, I said my problem with the with picking up Hillisang was that I think Fnatic was pretty good at playing, you know, fast, play around bot lane. They were very creative in the way they were like playing the game as well. And it was like each player could shine individually, but they wouldn't really shine as a team because GG was more about the teamwork and Fnatic was much more about the individual player trying to, you know, be a huge star. When they pick up Hillisang, I felt like they didn't fix any of the problems they had, which would be like. Uh, inconsistency, fairly poor macro. Uh, randomly, they would just like throw at Baron when technically they shouldn't know how to set it up after a full year together. And Hillisang does not fix those problems. He just makes them even better at playing the fast and aggressive style, where I actually think that might be a problem for them. But maybe Youngbuck yeah. can uh, help. But that here's one. the thing, man: is that that fast and aggressive style, as many weaknesses as it had, they were eleven and two in the summer season. So I, I think maybe you can call them a little bit overhyped, but I mean, come on, this is still a team that even with all of their problems was at the top of Europe yeah, in summer. Yeah. I actually uh, disagree a little bit with, with both of you guys because I think they were like doing this at the beginning. They, they were like really aggressive and fast games, but it's like Fnatic was actually a good team last year. Like when we screamed them, like they were they were a good team. They, I always call them bad. They, like they, they, they were not, they were not as good a team as us. Like in terms of like team, but they would do this some kind of like outside of the box thinking stuff. Yeah. Like especially by Soas and Cups. Like they were really good at like doing those stuff. But the problem is that they were like kind of inconsistent at playing normal game too. So their inconsistency would mesh with their like out of the, outside of the box stuff. So they were sometimes like look not so good and sometimes they would look really insane, you know? So that, I think that was the biggest problem is the inconsistency. But I think in the last two games, Cups has played really, really good. Like Agree. almost like flo almost flawless. So maybe he's going to look to fix his inconsistency problems on stage. So I mean, it sounded to me like you did kind of agree at least with the yeah, yeah, idea yeah. of like, you yeah, know, yeah, inconsistent yeah. fanatic. And again, I just don't think Hillisang is the answer to that. I think someone else on the team needs to be the answer. Or the coaching staff or something. Yeah, someone uh, has to step up. Yeah, sure. someone needs to step up and be like, guys, let's try and figure out what it is we're doing wrong and how we can work on these things. Because we're really good at some things, 
But we also have some weaknesses I think they need to fix if they want to become a great, great team. Definitely feels like a project. All right, I'm going to go next. And I feel like you guys might flame me for this one. But I'm going to go underrated. And right now, after week one of the EULCS, I think Giants are underrated. Bear with me. I think Ruin's solid. I think people are going to overhype Ruin because he had one outplay where White Knight threw himself under a tower, right? Yeah. But I also think <laughs> Joko played an incredibly solid early game. I think game. played for Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Steelback isn't buying QSS first anymore. He's playing more aggressive. The team is putting resources into him, and he's looking good. Now, once again, they were rated at 10th, but I do think they're underrated. I think this is a clear middle-of-the-pack team, and I think if they keep getting better, they're a playoff contender by the end of the split. Wait, so they're middle-of-the-pack. Which teams are under them? In this, like, just name right, a few. Right now, I'd say Unicorns of Love. I would say if they cleaned up their game, they could have beaten Vitality. Sure, right? yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that they got outscaled in the end, and they played pretty sloppy. Uh, I think that they can beat Rock Hat as well. I, I think Rock Hat's Baron control is really good, but I, don't, I haven't seen it consistently enough to expect it. I think a lot is still up to change, but I think if this team actually improves from where they're starting, they're starting much, much higher than anyone gave them credit for, because when I saw Steelback and Betsy recycled onto a new roster, I expected just kind of the pits, and now it's actually looking like a team that can contest. You guys are playing Giants this week. Uh, yeah, we are. You scared? Playing Giants. Oh, I'm not scared. <laughs> I mean, right now, like, we are, like, we are not so good, but we are not really bad. Like, I would, ex like, we are kind of inconsistent right now, you know, like, we are still learning, trying to mesh together, so... Uh, I'm not gonna say, like, we are for sure gonna shit on them, because I think every team in Europe right now is pretty bad. Like every single start of thing. the season, man. It's start of the season. Yeah. It's always the same. But in like in like five six weeks, yeah. when the meta shapes up more and the teams like get to like put, put, uh, get their bases down, like you will see who is a good team and who is not a good team. So it's really hard to say right now. Yeah. All right. Would you say that they're at least above tenth place? Uh, yeah, I mean for yeah. sure. They they, yeah. they seem they seem a little better than than what I than what I would get credit right. for. Like I was surprised. <laughs> I'll call that a small win, but there we don't we don't have to stick on Giants much longer because obviously there's there's bigger teams <laughs> to talk about and Deficio. Yeah. Your last buddy, what do you got for me? Overhyped and underrated. Just like perks, I'm also going with uh, overhyped. I'm picking Vitality as overhyped right now. I, I know some people will uh kill me for this because I'm talking down about uh, God Gilius, but I mean, this Vitality team, they're 2-0, which is a great start. And I really, they're exciting to watch because they have these new rookies who are not afraid of making plays. But, I mean, they almost lost to Giants where they had a horrible early game where everything went wrong. And I look at this team and I just think over the next few weeks, they won't be able to uh, just win through playing very aggressive around mid and jungle in the early game, which is what they did in the first game they played, where they went top lane with Copper Shot like a few times, and it worked. So I think we're going to get more games like the ones they played against Giants, where they're not necessarily winning laning phase, they're not really winning uh, the early game super hard. And then the team actually had a lot of issues understanding when they were behind what the enemy team could do. I think Giants like three times in a row pushed two side lanes, Walked mid lane, and Vitality was overextended mid lane, and then they just like collapsed on them from the side with Cho'Gath, and I think there was some other champion, I don't remember, and just killed them like two or three times, and Giants technically, had they just gone Baron with Cho'Gath, early in the game, would have probably just won the game, so. But doesn't it give Vitality a little bit of credit that they're able to stall a game out like that, that they're able to hold on, or are you putting that all on Giants kind of hey, being inexperienced? I think that's credit to Vitality for that one, and they played really well in the late game team fight. I just don't think this team is gonna stay as like a top three team or you're in Europe. Like they're sitting number one at the moment with the 2-0 after That's one right. week. Don't forget it. Uh, so I think this team is going to start falling down the standings a little bit, especially when they play against some of the better lineups uh, like G2, Fnatic, uh, Schalke. And I think uh, they're in the middle of the pack. All right, uh, Luca, what's your impression of Vitality so far from the first week? Do you think that this is a, a top-tier contender, or are you kind of a, agreement with Deficio that this is going to be a, a middle-of-the-pack team? Uh, I'm definitely agreeing with Deficio. Like, I, I was maybe going to put them in the even, like, or have team, but I didn't know how high, like, I don't really know what, like, what community rates high or what, what is, like, hyped, so I just guess by Fnatic for the Sure. Because yeah. the fan base. Because you know that they're, they're always, yeah. they're always, yeah. they're they're always hyped. hyped. <laughs> but, like, uh, Vitality is for sure, like, way or blown like they're actually not that like they're really not that good and just every team is like not so good right now so they got like even when they had when the game was like tanking up mm -hmm. against h2k they were still struggling to actually end the game like they i think they have like good like some good players like ad and mid i think they're, they're yeah I like, like th th those those they, they are good rookies i think but i think against like better teams they will not get these leads or like they will just like 
Yeah, they, they, they will not be. They, they have a lot to learn. Like obviously, you know. I think just the biggest credit I want to give them now. Again, calling them overhyped is not meaning I'm calling them complete garbage or anything. Like I actually think they they could probably gonna fight for that playoff spot, uh, number six and number five. But I love the fact that they have a bunch of rookies who walk on stage in the first week, and it looks like they're playing the same way they play in scrims. Like Jizuke, yeah, yeah. when I watch him play, he's just in people's face like yeah. all the time. He's not being like scared or nervous or whatever. He even said in the interview, he's like, "Yeah, I love being on stage. It makes me play better." Like. That is super cool to see from new players. Yeah, and, and that's something that's going to help them a lot here in the start, at least, in picking up wins. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good look for them. We'll see how they do in the next week. See if your, your prediction is true if they start to fall against top teams. Article 18 or they're baby. the new kings of Europe, baby. Never question God Gillis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, the big thing I want to talk about is the meta right now. 8.1, uh, a lot of controversy surrounding it. And just a stat to start us off. Current average game time in Europe following week one is 42 minutes and three seconds. <sighs> Long games, Scaling. Can I add something to that? Yeah, jump in here. Uh, not a single inhib died until 30 minutes in Europe as well. And we looked at the average game time since 2013 when LCS was a thing. It started until now. And obviously, everyone has been the average for the entire season until this one, which is just week one. But this is the highest average game time we've had on that list. No other season has had a longer average game time, but obviously it's a very short season so far. Still, makes it sound more dramatic. All right, well, Perks is our, is our resident player expert. What's your impression of the meta right now? Why, why are the games so, so long? Well, I'm actually not completely certain yet, but I think it's like a mix of everything. Like, I think it's, first of all, I think it's a mix of teams just not being good enough to snowball or play mid-game properly, uh, including us, like we got a Nash stolen. That's seven minutes more on our game time against Misfits instead of like taking inhibitors down earlier, you know? So that's like the small things like that, like not being good enough with vision, playing around waves, you make the games automatically go five to ten minutes longer. Mm -hmm. And also the mix of early game, like Relic Shield on AD carries, um, uh, things like Milan is only about push and you can't even dive bot anymore because there is top watches, Relic Shields, uh, tank supports with uh, save, AD, save AD carries. Like there's just like, it's very hard to actually do a play, uh, maybe like playing around top or something, but then there's tanks and it's like, it's just the game is going to prolong and the scaling is going to win like most of the time as of right now, you know, unless a team is like longs, you know, where you can actually play successfully top carries and maybe snowball a game, you know, so I think it's, I think it should be better next patch, but we'll, we'll see, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we have a little bit more time here. The Relic Shield feels like a big part of it, the melee support. Is, is, like, are defensive options just too strong across the board right now in the current meta? Does that feel like a big yes. factor? No, of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, like, one of the problems is that you can blind pick Tom Kench. Any meta where you can blind pick Tom Kench is a bad meta in many ways because that means you have a support <laughs> which is going to make it impossible to dive that bot lane and, like, really shut it down hard. And... Normally, an answer could be you pick a range support, and you're like, huh, Tom Kench, useless, you know, push him in, take his tower, he's not doing anything. But now, it's really hard to do that because you can't really poke him out of lane due to double relic shield, and the AD carry has overheal as well most of the time and fleet footwork, so these, like, poke lanes are just really hard to play against it. So 8.2 with the relic shield nerf, which effectively means half, uh, you only get half HP of your range champion, by the way, super sucks for like Thresh and these champions who won. <laughs> Get wrecked, baby. Thresh, and they're like, nah, you're just even more used to that. <laughs> Screw you. Um, but uh, it does make it uh, obviously much harder for Nate to carry to just take Relic Shield and have the double uh, sustain. So I, I hope it's enough to make people play non Relic Shield Lady Carries, and therefore some of the tank tanks might uh, be harder to execute in lane versus poke. But Overheal is still there, man. And that stuff is still strong. Yeah, it definitely looks to be the case. Also, stopwatches. I, I mean, it, it's good to talk a little bit about 8.2. The patch notes did just come out, and I think it's nice to see that there are some changes. Whether they'll be good or bad for the meta, we'll find out. But the other thing about this that's not really getting changed is stopwatch, right? And I think the community is clearly very upset about stopwatch, but there seems to be a lot of different opinions from the, the pro player perspective. Luca, how do you feel about, about stopwatch being in the game and specifically kind of the, the options in the inspiration tree? I mean, I think stopwatch is like, it's, it's a cool thing to have. It's a cool thing to use, especially like on like an early game, but I think six minutes is way too early. Like if you get it maybe in 10 minutes, then maybe it's like more fair. And early game is actually like mm -hmm. more explosive. Like I think that would be like more fair. Like 
I, uh, I spoke to Jana and he said like maybe it's like 15 minutes, you know, but it's like, I think like, ten, too far, I think like 10 minutes is like actually fair for this item because it just gives you like so much in terms of like safety and it gives you actually like 600 gold value. So yeah, I think it's a bit overtuned mastery tree, the inspiration. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, my my impression is is that I mean it leads to some really cool things, and I like that it it makes the Zanyas active available for things that aren't just mages, right? I think that leads to some super cool moments. Uh, I remember the ambition game where he like at almost thirty minutes leapt in as a Jarvan and Zanyas immediately, and that was like one of the coolest team fights I've seen in LCK so far. But at the same time, we also have these team fights where you're diving bot lane at seven minutes after you have wave pressure, and you don't actually get to kill anybody, and it just all turns against you. Another problem with it is the difference in solo queue and competitive. Because in solo queue, it actually makes people play more aggressive because they can tower dive and then use stopwatch to reset tower aggro, you know? And it's like, oh, look at me, I can dive in and I'm, I'm awesome. And not that many people will even take it because they're, they're just taking all the stuff. Like, a lot of solo queue players, they want stuff that deals more damage. Stopwatch doesn't deal any damage for you. But in competitive, people just grab on like six champions out of 10 and they know how to use it, which is effectively use it defensively as much as possible and not offensively to just stall the game with a scaling champion. So that's kind of the issue with it. Um, I like the 10 minutes. I like that part. I also don't know if, does it really need the rune gives you reduced cooldown on items that are built from stopwatch, like hourglass and GA and that kind of stuff. Like, does, is that really needed in the rune? Or is the, getting the stopwatch itself just strong enough? Like, I just feel like there are a lot of ways you can actually nerf the rune without maybe hitting stopwatch and, too hard. And here's the question. If if you this item was not free and available in runes, would anyone other than a mid laner actually buy If you have to spend 600, 600 gold, to, buy gold to get a Zanyas active, would anyone actually buy this item? You would if you played against like Zed or something. Else yeah, I think that, like you would buy it sometimes, like for sure on AD carries or even supports, like even junglers. I think you would buy it on champs that like go in, maybe like Javan or something, and then you can Zonya or if you need that against something as AD carry, you know, like I think you would actually buy this item, you know? So it's not like the item is bad. I just think it's really... Two over two and together for free at six minutes. That's the whole, yeah. Yeah, timing may be a better thing. I, I think the biggest uh, kind of abuse case that we've seen of this so far, or the best user of Stopwatch or, or Zanyas in general right now, is Rise. Oh. And uh, Deficio obviously has some very strong opinions on Rise, so why don't you just share with us how you feel about, about this interaction? I just think this is one of the dumbest mechanics in the game I've seen in a long time. Like, I'm trying to think about other times over the last few years where I've watched a certain mechanic in the game that made me just go, this is completely dumb, and there's no counterplay to it. Because there really is no... Like, I guess the counterplay is that you chain CC the rise before you can even click alt and anything. <laughs> uh, All right, and to, like, cl to clarify, we're talking about the, the Zanya's interaction with Rise Alt, which is Realm Warp, which is basically that if Rise is golden, you can't do anything. Yes. And even if his allies get stunned or locked up, they it doesn't matter. They still get ported out. Because the ulti is only interrupted, the teleportation is only interrupted if Rise is CC'd. Now, I will say, I did actually learn something the other day that made me less tilted about the combo. And actually means it is, I think it is interruptible. If you have a snare, and you use it on Rise, it actually keeps him in place even when he clicks Hourglass, correct? Yeah, it's a blank chain and Karma W that yeah. like stop his uh, combo. Uh, Morgana ult, apparently. Yeah, uh, Morgana ult. Should also work yeah, any ult, of yeah. the, the temporary... Yeah, so if you hit that snare on him before he clicks Hourglass, then when he clicks Hourglass, he actually stays in place yeah. And he doesn't get ported out. I think his teammates will still get ported out. I'm not, yeah, maybe. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, sure about that. Yeah. But at least, at least Rise actually stays. So, uh, I was less tilted about it because there was potential counterplay in that sense. Yeah, you just need very specific champions. Blanc, Morgana, or Karma. You just need very specific <laughs> champions. Kled, I guess Kled Q could probably do it too, right? The bear trap on a rope. Yeah, if you time it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's a dumb combo and I think it shouldn't port out teammates. Uh, if they get CC'd in it, or if Rise uses Hourglass, there needs to be some sort of punishment that means you don't just get ported out with your entire team. I mean, Perks, what is your impression? Because, I mean, Deficio is clearly very it's upset about this. So but you but you actually play Rise. You've played Rise yeah. as a mid laner. How do you feel about this? I mean, <laughs> since I play Rise, I obviously like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like to use it in terms of, like, but I like to use it in terms of 
actually outplaying people, even though like sometimes when you play against Rise, he can push a wave extra, which other minions cannot allow themselves to push on side wave. So if they try to gank him, you can get free mid priority and some wards, you know, and they can, can join you guys later. And most of the time when he pushes the extra wave, teams don't even go for him because they just know it's it's pointless because it's Rise. So you can actually play a mini game with it. And you can also just save it for the team fights because what that's what I like to do. Sometimes I go for the extra wave, but sometimes I just like to save it for the team fights and actually like outplay something. Like I really enjoy using my old Zonia to outplay like Rakan RW. I think I did it a couple of times in this game. Sick outplay mate. <laughs> you click those two buttons real fast. No, no, but it's like I mean dodge it before yeah, before yeah. before he shoots it. You know, uh, like dodge a skill shot before they shoot it, and they are shocked and then you teleport behind them with Zonia, and it's like it's just a, it's a really fun thing to use, but it's a bit yeah, it's a bit overtuned. I think uh, I don't know. It's. It's really strong, but if you remove it, it's like Rise is still gonna be a fine champ, but it's okay. like yeah, I think maybe they should just yeah, remove it. But I mean like how how big of an impact is it, right? Because it does feel like a really valuable escape tool in a meta that is about stalling out, waiting for your comp to scale up. In, I think in any meta it's gonna be super useful. In any meta where uh, if your team gets caught out, like let's say you rush a baron or something, and the enemy team shows up to fight you. Any meta where you can have a champion that can click a massive group teleport, where he can just click hourglass and then you won't interrupt him and the entire team is out, like, that's just super useful. Not even just in the stalling meta, just in general. Like, that is too strong. And the worst part is, I remember watching Faker play Rise just when he got reworked, like, about two years ago, one, one and a half years ago or something, when the ulti was introduced... And he didn't build our glass with it. And he, you had to watch him dance around in a little circle, dodging skill shots. And he did it to perfection. And I was just like, this is amazing. I love this ult. I love everything about this. And then I get the our glass one where you don't have to dodge anything. You just click our glass and you're like, whoop, I'm out. Fair. Luca had one moment like that in week one. You probably had one too. He well. dodged around a blue buff and got out. See, that's, that's sick. That's sick. I love that stuff when you can dodge around in the rise old. I agree. It does make it a little bit more exciting. But I mean, it sounds like it's an interaction that, that is good. It's a little too powerful. I hope they remove it, personally. Just 100% remove it. Is there any middle ground where you would be like happy with the change? I think if Ryze clicks Hourglass, ulti stops. Or he doesn't port with it, at least. Uh, I need something there. <laughs> oh, that was, uh, uh, give me, give me something. You guys can't Luca. see the face of something. pain on Luca. Uh, I don't know, oh, guys. Like, I, I would like, I would like it to stay, <laughs> just stay a little bit longer. I mean, honestly, I think it's probably fair to just remove it because it's yeah. If he uses Zonia, he should at least stay there and die for his team. Exactly. And his team could go out. I think that, he could that be a hero then. I think that could be fair. Yeah, I think that that could be cool because you can see maybe him ghosting after and flashing away or something. Yeah, like trying cool. to run like a golden hero, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think maybe they should change something a lot because it's it's really overpowered, even for like me, you know. Yeah, it's not the most fun. Well, the mid lane in general right now is kind of exciting. Uh, I mean, Rise is obviously the big one that we're talking about. By but exciting, also, you mean boring. It's but really not exciting. <laughs> I, Zoe is a champion that gets me hype. I mean, I'm sure she's a terrible. But let's talk about so mid lane meta. The big four uh, that I've been led to believe. Don't correct me if I'm wrong, but we have Rise, Azir, Malzahar, and Zoe are, are kind of the big ones that we correct. expect every single game. So so. You've called this mid lane, uh, I'm not going to quote you because I already forgot what you said, but bad. We're not excited about this mid lane. Talk to me about it. I mean, so I had a tweet last night that uh, Perks was so nice. He actually quoted it as well and said something about how boring it was. But effectively, uh, right now, the top five regions in the world here in 2018, Azir, Rise, Zoe, Malzahar are the top four. Uh, Azir, 89% presence, so he's almost pick banned in close to every game. And then Malzahar, 73% uh, presence in the pick and ban phase. The jump to the next mid laner is Oriana with 12% presence. <laughs> it's like insane jump from the top four to everything else. Mm. Which is, it tells us, you know, how often we just see the same four champions getting cycled around in the pick and ban phase, either banned or picked against each other. And if at least then these four champions like hard countered each other, so it was like, ah, you can't blind pick Mal Zahar if these two champions are open because then he's screwed or something. But people just seem to not care. Just like, Wait, yeah, are any, are, is there actually any like 100% hard counter matchup between these four champions or can they all pretty much just be blind picked? I mean, there's no like hard matchups, but it's like, it's sometimes a bit annoying to play like Azir against Zoe or 
it's annoying to play as here against Rice sometimes too. Like it depends on it depends on also like jungle matchups and team comps. Like it depends on all situations. So that's why you can basically just blind pick either of those, whichever fits the team comp and whichever you want to play or play around. So the meta is kind of boring because there is no linking them anymore. There is just like pushing and rolling, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it's just like not interactive that there is only four champs you can play because you really cannot play other champs. I mean. Maybe you can play something in a very like one out of ten case scenario, like I'm a Cassidy or Vladimir or something that you can see in LPL, this kind of picks that actually win games. But in terms of like actually blind picking or even playing a stable champion, you cannot actually play anything else. Yeah, so it's pretty, it's pretty boring. I hope it gets changed soon. Yeah. I mean, we have 8.2 is Malzahar nerf it was pretty big. He got 20 seconds more cooldown on his old. He lost AP ratio on Q. So that's pretty big. Um, Rise might get hit by the minion acro change as well. Um, Azir is going to be left untouched. So he's probably just going to be S tier, pig ban. Yeah, ban Azir is going to be game. probably like, really broken. But there might be some changes. I, I just kind of hope for some buffs for some of the weaker picks that we don't see very often. Like, I miss watching Talia. A lot. Yeah. I think she adds a lot to competitive games. Like I want more Aurelian Soul as well in my no. games. But Aurelian Soul is the most like toxic. Yeah, but it's champion, fun to dude. watch. Uh, you know? I agree. It's hype to cast. I, I, I miss, love it. I miss Rihanna and Syndra. <laughs> no, we had Oriana two years Syndra. of that. <laughs> yeah, I would like two years more. Every other meta is Oriana Syndra meta. Okay, do, so what about Zed? What about Zed? How do we get our boy Zed in the meta? I, I, I don't know. I think I gave up on like, our boy Zed a very long time ago. Oh. I, I'm very happy when I can actually get to play him occasionally here and there but it's like every time i played him it has not actually been there was only once he was good in the meta that was season seven spring this like last year spring when he was at reality meta uh -huh. he was actually pretty good back then i not a regret but i wish i could play more i wish i just told my team and my coach like this champ is actually so good right now i will play it more but i didn't i wasn't sure but when Natality got nerfed and like even zed got nerfed a bit then i think then i was like fuck this champ was so good you know and um, yeah, I played only one game. I played an IEM too. I got like two or three wins. That I got, I got two or three wins on right. Spring Split. So yeah, I missed that. Yeah. So we, you want Zed back? Is, is there and Oriana? And, I, I, I don't, I don't need hype. Oriana. I'm, please, no more Oriana. Oriana Syndra. Just for like, give us some weird stuff. You know, I want. I like Cassio. the Lucian mid meta too. I perks didn't like that. Obviously, in terms no, of no, I I was the best Lucian. Like, all right. Let me just find some uh, perks. Oh, hold on, why you find perks? Yeah, I can tell you Lucian. Sorry, like my Lucian was really good. Since MSI, since I saw Faker play in scrims, he was really insane with Lucian and I got motivated. And then we went into ELCS where I was really good with Lucian and I was winning lanes with Lucian all the time. Mm. But we were just not very good at playing around Lucian mm. and we were in a slump as a team. Mm. Uh, but then the G2 came back and resurrected and without Lucian. And in finals we brought out the Lucian. You did! We brought out the Lucian <laughs> and we won two games with Lucian. Yeah, no. And Wait, my what? Lucian was so cool. I mean you got the two wins, but do we want to talk about what your KDA was? What yeah, you can you can you can bring up my KDA. I think it was something like 14 uh Oh in the final. Yeah. Oh okay. What yeah. about overall for your Lucian <laughs> in 2017? I mean my KDA was not that bad, was it? It was two point four. <laughs> yeah. It's not mine. It's nine, nine games. It's not mine. It's you're correct. Give, give the win rate real quick. You had a forty-four percent win rate, uh, but obviously, um, okay, but you can always defend yourself by saying my team didn't understand how to play around Lucia. My team actually did not understand. How to play did, there Lucia. you go. Like, they actually did not. <laughs> we learned. It was fun though. It was actually fun to watch because it was like. Lucian got locked in by perks. We were like, first we were like, whoa, this is hype. Let's see what he can do. And then I think the first game you played, you went like 0 5 on it or something. And it was like, wow, okay. Yeah, you had a really horrible the first one. game I played was against Fnatic. Uh, oh, let's I was it. winning lane really hard, like enemy mid was inting. And then uh, sec the next time I played against, uh, what, what was it, uh, NFP. That game I was in. Ah, uh, there, yeah, that was, was the like game. 0 4 or something? Yeah, that was a 0 4 and game. And you won that game. I won the game, but. That game, like, I actually had FPS drops and someone told me it's all in your head. Like, the referee told me in before the game, it's all in your head, dude. And then every time I would use a dash, I would get 40 FPS in the whole game. And I thought it was all in my head, but then after the game, I was so mad. It was insane. So, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I have an excuses. You know, I have yeah, some excuses. Yeah, so strange. many ready. I respect that, like, man. You're never going excuses. down. It's yeah, a bad Lucian is never going down, man. You can <laughs> trash my other channels, but then... You're the greatest Lucian of all time. Yeah. There it is. On record. Get that quoted.
Og så der er der er en historie vi talked about Z just before where in December when the new G2 lineup got together, I remember having a brief chat to to you Perks about you know what you were playing and so on. I think you told me you were playing Z, and he was pretty good right now. The SS. I I I seem to remember and and I went like, nah, there's no way, there's zero chance. Like this is just something in scrims, it's never gonna happen. And then like a week later, we talked again. You're just like, nah, nah. Z is bad. Matt is just the Z, Malzahar, Zoe, whatever, all the time. You can't play Z at all. Yeah, I'm like, ah. Z, you get the sleepy bubble on you. For a moment, I was like, oh, lethality. Because I think it was when the runes, the armor runes were obviously gone. So, like, yeah, lethality. Maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah, like, talent well, and it actually, it actually hurt Z more than the, what did mages, because, like, magic resist rune was more overpowered than lane and armor rune. Especially for Z, because he, like, has a lot of mixed damage, you know, mm-hmm. like, from Ignite and Peace Passive and stuff. So, it's like... He needed the DMR rune for lane to actually be strong on lane. But now when he doesn't have that, like he's actually a one shot to mages and mages have stopwatch. <laughs> so it's like Zed is just oh, like yay. Zed is just got it. Like you can like you I don't think you can play Fizz or Zed or stuff. Like oh, and I yeah. love maybe Fizz. maybe you can actually play Yasuo because he doesn't get affected by the stopwatch so much. Because you actually just like you have more like sustained damage and just yeah, burst. You see that grabs. So, Yasuo, so maybe maybe we'll see a Yasuo from me at some point. I'm pretty sure you're undefeated on Yasuo in uh, 2017. My Yasuo is only <coughs> the only 100% winner champion vaults. There you go. <laughs> Against 1907 Fanabachi, and I just wanted to say the 1907 That's again. Give one more time is to tilt the It was 1907 Fanabachi. 1907 Fanabachi. 1907 Not to be confused with anything else. <laughs> All right, well, you kind of brought up your new team a little bit. I want to talk about them. Uh, and specifically... How does it feel to be like the last man standing uh, on the OG? And I, I mean, maybe it's not fair to call it the OG G2 roster, but the G2 roster that kind of saw the most success in Europe as a five man. Uh, feels pretty cool, honestly. Like, I think it's just a cool thing to have in my past. It's like we had this roster that has won four splits in a row or like Trick and I. So, and then we won MTV, we won three splits, and it's like an MSI, and didn't go out of groups last, like this year at Worlds. But uh, we were actually like, I'm happy with with us, you know. I wish we would have like a bit more in Worlds, like, because we were actually, we were actually a really good team, you know. Like, I, I don't want to say what we could have done or not, you know, but we were one game away, mm-hmm. like, and that game was really close, 55 minutes game against RNG or something. If we won that game, the Samsung 9-0 playoffs champions would be kicked out of, out of groups. Oh, that would have been an insane <laughs> world. <laughs> there, there is boom, you know, like Samsung 9-0 playoffs, but they will be done, so, you know, with one win. <laughs> but that's just like a, what ifs, you know, and stuff. So there's some regret to like us not doing more. Like not regret, but rather like, like disappointment, you know. Yeah. But having a new team is like a new journey and it's really exciting to see what we can what i can do with like new teammates like how far can we go like can we improve as much as we did in last team like can actually everyone do it you know because i i personally think that everyone can improve as much as we did you know it's not like we were I mean, we were pretty good individual players but like we were standing out as a team you know and that's what i want to see from uh the new, the new g2 as well how much does it hurt g2 losing someone like mythy just in terms of how much he added with outside of the game stuff like uh, game knowledge and these kind of things. Uh, I think it does not hurt at all right now. If he had left one year ago, I think G2 like would maybe be a top tier team, but we would not have a chance to be the best because okay. I was just too unexperienced and like. But uh, during the last year, like actually, I had like I was learning a lot about the game itself. And how all the roles work and everything. Like I, I can, I can have a pretty good understanding of every how every role works and what everyone should do on the map at what point of the game. And that's something that like I enjoyed working with Mitty because during the roles bootcamp, like we would always like we would often like have talks, you know, like with the rest of the teammates as well, you know, and we would have like some discussions, you know, about meta, like thinking like more of the game, you know. But right now we are the new team, we are learning basics. So I'm pretty sure in a couple of months' time, like we can come to the same point where we can actually like, where we can talk about stuff that are like advanced, you know. But right now we are just a new team and we have to get down all the basics and learn to play together. So, so from what you're saying, it feels kind of like you've stepped into some of that role that Mithy provided in terms of out of game knowledge. That now that you have an understanding of every role, you can kind of 
help grow the team uh, at you know not as as not just a mid laner, but as kind of a player who can help everybody. Uh, k- k- kind of yeah, because uh, like every everyone from my team is a very good individual player, and they're very smart and they're good about their own role, but they are not like not all of them are used to sacrificing their own lane or their own resources to help others, and they're not they're not as aware of a team play like team play in the high high level game as I am because I was lucky to play against such top teams for like my last two years playing against SKT, Samsung and things like that playing against every Korean like like long zone screams like I played against all the top Korean teams Chinese teams like any teams everyone NIP NIP <laughs> <laughs> like I, I've just had the, the pleasure of like playing against these teams and see how they play you know so it's very easy for me to to see what should be done in game after so long time. But isn't it like, like one thing I see with a lot of teams right now um, is, and this is actually something that's been happening ever since Professional League of Legends started, is it's very easy to get five players together who are all like at least pretty good individually at playing the game, but it's really hard to get people who can kind of understand that you need to not just, you know, do something because that's what you're used to, but you need to like pause and be like, why am I doing this? Like. Why am I pushing the bot lane right now? Why am I trying to create set up this team fight? Why am I putting wards here? And a lot of players seem to not do that. Where that's what I like with Mithy as an example. I always felt like he would kind of question, not he wouldn't say, "Oh, we lost this fight, so it was a bad fight." He would be like, "Why did we take the fight in the first place? Should we have taken the fight? Did we take it the correct way?" Is that something you're doing now with this team, and that other players are also doing on G two? Uh, uh, it's something that I'm doing for sure, and I think the other players are doing it too. I just m- maybe like I just notice it more, but I- I'm not sure because I think everyone from my team is actually like really good and really smart. You know, there are just like some like very small things that they uh, that they're not, that they're not they didn't, that they're not familiar with. You know, mm-hmm. they they are just not familiar with because they have not experienced it on their past teams, and. It's something that we are learning now together because it's not like I'm actually teaching them or something. We are actually, I'm just trying to ask questions and our coach is doing that too. And then we just, we just learn together. Like we we are just trying to relearn the game or like learn it as a new team. So uh, it's going to take us some time, but I'm really sure that we can do it. Everyone is like very committed and willing to improve. So yeah, it's only time can tell, you know. Yeah. Well, when we talk about kind of new teams coming together, we always, you know, speculate as analysts on broadcast what a team's identity is going to look like, right? And I think it's still a big question for us. Even, I mean, it's one week and best of one, so I guess it's only two games, so it makes sense it's still a question. For, yeah. <laughs> it's Hopefully. not that much of a sample size, unlike best of three. But uh, what G2's identity is going to look like? Because against Misfits, you guys look super controlled, super disciplined. I mean, yes, there were... A few instances around Baron that, that were, weren't great, but right for the most part in the early game it was a very calm, patient game. Uh, the Rocket game was much more chaotic, right? Much more counting against you. So, mm-hmm. what, where do you see G two as a team? Is it going to go back to kind of towards where old G two was, where you play the most efficient game at all times, you know, whatever that looks like, or is it going to be more about individual carries stepping up? Where do you see this team kind of going as you move forward? I don't really think the Rocket game was chaotic at all. Like I made a mistake in the early game, which was my lane was the pressure lane, and I was supposed to. Like after my tier got list base, I would pressure a zero at every point, but I made a bedroom bot and then I died to gank after later. So basically, like I just kind of ruined the early game for us, and we made some mistakes later, like giving a pre nash. But the game was not chaotic. We just like less. We fell behind with a verse, with a verse late game comp. So our early game was better than them, but we fell behind. And then when you fall behind with an early game comp, it is in theory very very hard to win the game and we still stole the game until like 45 minutes or something we actually almost came back as well there was like if we played better team fights maybe if we played perfectly and then they misplayed a bit we could have won the game you know so i i think we played well from behind and with uh the resources we've given like we've put the position we put ourselves into but i just think it's um what you said, we are looking to play the kind of perfect game by the book, at least now in the beginning. That's how we were with G22. Like we were practicing, just learning all the basics and making sure we can do it all the time, you know? And then after we're done with the basics, we can go on, we can advance, you know, we can start like advancing the game faster because like G2 in in playoffs or in Worlds, like we were really good at ending the games fast, you know? Like 
the Vince that we had against RNG in the road. It was like a 25 minute win or something. It was basically a stomp, you know, or against Fenerbahce. I mean, it's like in the first game against RNG, we were advancing the game really fast. Then we made some hiccups and then we lost. But I, I'm just like, the point is that we were, we were, at the beginning, we were slow and slow and slow. But as the time went on, we got better and better and faster. We, and we were good with all the basics done. So that's what I'm looking for in the new little, in the new G2 lineup. And uh, yeah, no. It's kind of, I mean, it's always interesting to hear that. And it's, it's cool to hear that you've kind of kept this over. Because I think a lot of people would have looked at this team and expected that style of play to come from Sven and Mithy. I think would have been would have been my impression from an outside eye, right? And it's cool to hear that this is something that even without the remaining members of your team, that you're trying to preserve like as a style, as an identity for, for the organization and for the team moving forward. And just to give some context on that one, like when Sven and Mithy was on Origin, Origin had a fairly slow early game, most of the time at least, wanted to try and play that game where you don't take 50-50s, you always make sure it is in your favor, you're trying to always gain a numbers advantage before you make a play, uh, so that you are sure, okay, this is a good play now, we can pull this off. And and that was kind of Sven and Mithy style with Origin, where they also knew, because that's Sven, if they went to late game, they could win most games, because Sven was just a better AD carry than whoever he was facing on, being it Callista or Jinx or whatever it was, especially at Worlds, that was what we saw like so often from them. And then G2, when you guys just came into the league with you and Trick, it was like, super fast, uh, perks on LeBlanc and Assassin, Ari, and just like fucking killing people everywhere. And that was like, what it looked like, okay, that was Perks' play style, at least again from an outside perspective. So when Sven and Mithy joined and G2 changed, because you guys did, you guys became a team, at least in the start, that played much, much slower. And you were not just playing Assassins that would kill everything, you would play a lot of more control mages, it seemed like that it was the shift to happen because of Sven and Mithy. But obviously you're now talking about how it's more about learning the basics first. And once you learn the basics, you learn the next step, and then you can start actually snowballing games faster because you know exactly how to execute a tower dive, when you should roam here, when you should set up Baron, when you should execute Baron, and then suddenly the game is over in like 25 minutes, right? So I think this was this lineup, because Sven and Mithy were gone, what we looked at and what I looked at was like, okay, there's going to be a different G2. What did on Rocket was like, Playmaker, like, Playmaker. let's go, let's like, go. Yeah. Super aggressive, like, so often he would just be the guy in the front, forcing a fight on Alistar, Rakan, these kind of picks. Yankos is a player who I think is less about the first blood king than he used to be. Like, even yeah, last year, he was actually playing a bit slow in the early game. Uh, but I look, like, you look at him and you look at you, Perks, and you're like, Yankos and Perks together. One guy picks an early game jungler, the other guy picks LeBlanc. And they didn't go together. In the I mean, mid lane. literally, we had Vettius jumping up and down screaming. He's like, <laughs> "They're gonna kill everybody!" Yeah, jungle then, mid, then jungle you go into mid, the jungle mid, lane, mid. and these two guys will just completely wreck everyone just on pure mechanics. But then the first game we get Sejuani and I think Azir or something, or it was Rise, Rise, Rise but yeah. Sejuani, and we're like, "Oh, oh, okay. Well, I guess." You don't sound disappointed. It's Maybe later we get it. Maybe later. I mean, I, I, I actually I understand the whole like let's learn all the basics first, and then you can start playing more aggressive if the right. meta also suits. I that. agree, and I agree. Uh, just to, to, I was just kind of dreaming of the to round this out while you're sitting over here telling us about your dream. I mean, I respect the way the G two is trying to play it, but do you think it is would be viable right now with the players that you have to play like a super mid focused you and Yankos versus the world kind of strategy where you guys just crush mid lane. I think people have wrong perception of Yankos. Like, See, that's the thing. He's like people think of him as a first blood king or a carry jungler. There's a the two like first blood king, yeah maybe, but carry jungler, like he's not a carry jungler. He's the most selfless jungler that I've ever like heard of or like worked with, you know? He very much cares about lanes over himself, which is sometimes a very good thing, sometimes not so good because he needs to be learned to be more selfish. Like I was learning with I was playing with Trick, and Trick is like a carry jungler, you know? He does his camps, he gets his free time, and then he gives you his free time. But with Yankos, he's like he sacrifices his time to help you, which is like I'm not used to playing with this, you know? And I'm I'm adaptive, so I can very easily adapt and we are like learning so much together and working together, but it's like we're not gonna pick like the blank listen or something and go mid because not that's, yet, not yet, yeah, <laughs> because that is not meta, you know. <laughs> so you kind of just like the players right now. Everyone is 
it's just so much like there is not much about mechanics anymore. Everyone is like yeah, our yeah. equally mechanics, you know. We didn't, we are not better mechanically than someone. We are just very experienced and knowledgeable, so we can work well together and improve, you know. So yeah, I don't know if you're gonna be seeing that uh, ganking <laughs> ganking me twenty four seven, but we are for sure gonna be very good at playing together around vision and pressure and stuff. So. Because of this music to Deficio's ears. I mean, it does make me very happy, but I still have a little dream <laughs> of aggressive topside G two. Eight kills in the mid lane before fifteen minutes. Absolute blowout. But then and then cleanly snowball it. You know, from there, yeah, get the next, advantage next around mid. Get deep vision right. from that, and bam, game is over in 10, 20 minutes. Not even Uzi can defend against that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some aspirational goals there for, for G2 in the coming international events. Um, I want to look now. I want to talk a little bit more about you, Perks, specifically. You're, you're new on this team, and I feel like people have been excited about you for a while now, ever since, uh, I think, MSI, the, the clean movement on Oriana people and the public. Killing Faker. Killing Faker seems to be kind of generally in your favor. It goes up and down a little bit. But when, when you started, I feel like people just wanted to hate you. And so I want to I know a little bit more about like your experience with public perception and, and how it's been for you. Do you notice it now that you're like more appreciated, more uh, well-respected as a mid laner? I mean, for sure, you notice it. Yeah, you notice this kind of stuff like really easily, you know. And when I first came into LCS, uh, well, I just wanted to like be funny, I guess. <laughs> like it was like my hobby or something, and uh, I was just trolling everyone. Like I was just a little kid, you know, trolling everyone, ha <laughs> And then just saying random stuff that I didn't even think or think about. You know, I was just saying something and laughing off, you know, off, you know. And then everyone like seemed to love it or something, and then. Uh, at MSI, I made a very bad PR statement. Oh, God. <laughs> Which is like, I wasn't really like used. Uh, so I just said something around like, yeah, we took a vacation and something. But yeah. like, I was just trying to like cover up for the, like, our team, like changing, replacing members, you know, and our yeah. team uh, atmosphere. And then after we got, after that, that was like, and then people like started calling me like super cocky and disgusting or something because I, I didn't even say anything bad. I said something like, "Any Asian millionaires are not so much better than e than EU millionaires." Something like that. I said something like that, and then people started saying, "I was saying Asian millionaires are bad," <laughs> and that was like really shocking. And then there was this thing where uh, the Skype group thingy, and uh, that was overrated, and everyone was saying that I was replacing, <laughs> I was benching players in the LCS, and I was ruling the LCS. You're actually the mafia. Yeah, I was, I was EU I was controlling ELCS when I was seventeen, and then people were uh, flaming me for uh, when I meet the living origin. Like I got all the those people are still mad. They flamed the everything. They're still mad. I still see like, the origin like, flare and like, I got all Pekka fans, which is what like 500k people, <laughs> all Spaniards coming at me and hating on me and Zenimiti. So it was just like a mix of everything, and then like my poor roles performance, obviously, and then yeah. But what does that do to you when you were 17 years old? Like that's a lot of pressure and a lot of flame. Do you just ignore social media or? I mean, it's like I was saying at the beginning that I didn't really care, but it was getting to me, I don't know, like over the time when you get so many people like basically like hating you, you know, yeah. it's not an easy thing as I had to handle like as a like amateur, immature kid. And then like mix of everything during the worlds, like mix of burnout and overplaying, like not eating properly and having bad life, bad life routine with mix of community hate, etc. I think like got to me, all of that, like crushed me or like burned me down a little bit, you know, for for that time. And then, uh, uh, yeah, then I just like, I guess like matured over the off season. Like every off season, like you reflect a lot and you think a lot and you mature a lot more than... You read some books. You read some books and you like, you just, yeah, you, you mature more than you would do in average and um, like average in like school life, you know? So, yeah, that was definitely, like, the big changer, I guess, like, thinking in the off season. Yeah. yeah, so do you feel like now, like, if, if worse comes to worse and you're suddenly the most hated European player again, do you feel like you would be able to come into it with a better mindset and not let it affect you? Is it, is it still something you worry about, kind of this this fight over public perception? And no, I, I really do not, like, I do not care what people think about me or something. And, uh, like... It's nice that you are like loud or something, but it's like if I care about it, maybe it'll get to my head or something. So it's like I appreciate everyone that like gives me like nice messages and like supports me and stuff. And I really loved Brazil 
It was the best time oh. ever. Like I would go on stage and I would raise my hand, wave my hand, and there was like 6,000 people screaming and like raving and stuff. And that was like, I would get chills, you know, it was so insane. Like, ugh. I just want to go back to Brazil, you know, on that stage. Like, it was the best, the best, fan, best fans ever. So, uh, yeah, I just appreciate fans, but I don't... Like, not going to let it negatively like, I, impact you. Like from, like, from long time ago, like, I control my social media. You know, and social media does not control me. So it's just something that you have to learn when you're a pro player, when you're a big personality. You have to learn how to deal with stuff and how to control stuff, you know? I, I Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really important point. I think a lot of players and casters still yep. struggle with that. Yep. Is the the whole, like... Riding the Reddit up and down. That's the thing, the, the Reddit waves and, and, and Twitter as well. Like, it's... It's kind of crazy because in traditional sports, I always feel like the athletes care way less about social media, at least most of them, because it doesn't really impact them or their brands that much. If you just play, if you're good on the field and you do well, like, great, that, that's the most important thing. Uh, where in esports, because we all grown up with social media and the internet and people are a lot younger, it just feels like you get much more impacted and everyone is on social media, like every pro player is on, every every, every personality is, is part of social media one way or the other, and they read all this stuff. Uh, and it almost feels like it can actually hurt people so much more than it benefits them, because even if it's all positives, maybe they get a bigger ego then, and it actually makes them a worse teammate, because they only care about their social media now, and how many fans they have, and how much they're loved. So it actually feels like in a lot of ways, like the social media parts, while it is good for your, your personal brand value, it actually doesn't benefit you a lot as a professional player. Yeah. And, or a person. Or yeah, a person, think, maybe. And I think it's just, it's something that you're not used to, right? And any other career path you pursue and you're outside of the public eye, right? If you're if you're an architect, you don't have 10,000 people watching yeah. you go, oh, he messed that up. Yeah. This guy's an idiot. Like, he's Unless you're building the Berlin thing. Airport yeah. and you messed that one up. Everyone <laughs> is calling you an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is an interesting thing dealing with that. And, and one guy who has been getting a lot of hate recently, a pretty big name you may have heard of him, Perks, you rose up kind of to defend him to a certain degree, Bjergsen, uh, after TSM's first week, which was admittedly a pretty rough week, two pretty crushing losses. Um, this is a guy who, who's who been criticized very, very heavily for his performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and Perks, I wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about what your impression was of the situation and why you kind of chose to to speak up in, in defense of Bjergsen. I mean, first of all, everyone, like... When TSM does very well, Bjergsen is the biggest personality in esports right now. I mean, besides Faker, you know. But uh, everyone knows about Bjergsen and everyone knows his name. So when TSM does something good, everyone is like, Bjergsen, best player in the world. And when TSM does something bad, oh, Bjergsen, so bad, uh, why does he not do better? So it's just a very weird thing to go over. But I'm sure the Bjergsen is the self, like he doesn't really care so much about it. Maybe he gets a little bit affected by it. Obviously, it's a little bit annoying that casters make a um, kind of circle jerk a seg a segment <laughs> over his Zerat game when his performance was actually quite good at the game. And they did bring it out that he was like hitting skills and stuff, but they were like looking at a very small mistakes. They're not even mistakes that could be actually just played better or like. It's very easy to to see in the hindsight, you know, when you're playing in the game, and those mistakes don't matter at all for the game, not at all, and they were just like kind of making people hate him more. So I had to like write something, you know, because it was actually like I would get really annoyed if someone did it, like about me, you know, because it just not it was not fair. So yeah, that's. Do you think? I mean, do you think? Because Bjergsen has been for a long time. I think the big carry when you think of TSM, you think of Bjergsen because he has such these these big high highs, right? And some of that might be because he's a big personality. But do you think it's fair to hold him to a, a higher standard than you would another member of TSM because he has such a pedigree and because he's kind of expected to be this this big leader and this big carry? Uh, I don't think so because it doesn't matter what name you are or what you are, like you don't. Like, you cannot be expected to carry a game versus players that are actually close to equally as good as you, you know? That's just not possible, especially not at this meta. It's all about team game and not him doing something wrong. It's so much about communication, behind the scenes stuff, planning, preparation. Like, fans do not realize this, but League of Legends is just so much more than or individual in-game performance. And that's something that 
people cannot understand. So, but the whole like Björk's story over the years is is so interesting to follow because when he joined TSM, everything he did was perfect according to like everyone. Like it was praise Björkson, it was Björkson and four wards. You know, blame the jungler, blame the support, blame the AD carry. Uh, just blame someone who's not Björkson. That was like the first few years of it, and then I actually think. Uh, that the broadcast and us casters are in some ways a large part of why there are more Bjergsen haters now than they used to be. Uh, just because um, I think sometimes, and I did this during Worlds, which was a, which was a mistake from my side as well, is um, we look at Bjergsen and, and end up overrating him a little bit. Uh, compared to maybe where he is actually on like a top 20 list, uh, which of course is really hard to do and it's all just pure opinion based, but still, uh, that's that's one way to to place him maybe too high on a list. And uh, there was the whole Jensen versus Bjergsen debate during all of 2017 as well, which I think got a lot of people on edge of like, who is really better? Why why is this gonna constantly going to be this uh, big discussion where some people think Jensen is better, so they're gonna naturally going to hate more on Bjergsen, and some people think Bjergsen is better, so they're going to hate more on Jensen. And when Bjergsen then, uh, with TSM, they drop out of groups, uh, all the haters who are tired of hearing about Bjergsen on broadcast, who are tired of watching TSM win everything, they come out in full force and they're like, yeah, Bjergsen, you know, he's bad, all that kind of stuff. And I noticed it a lot when we did the, the top 20 thing um, after the group stages where I, I definitely still had him too high on, the, uh, on my list in terms of the actual performance shown uh, there. And I was kind of defending his performance a little bit. Like the entire Reddit thread was literally just people being like, how can we defend this? Why do we still do it? Blah, blah, blah. And the sad part was people were saying it was just a fake narrative being pushed. But I actually looked at the TSM games and I felt like he did all right. Uh, I probably should have moved him further down and someone like Perk should have been moved further up. But uh, so, so that one in hindsight... You know, but should have been changed so a little bit. in the middle of the podcast. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Yeah, it's because Perks is sitting there. He's, he's holding my hand right now. I'm just like, I'm flirting a little bit with him. But in hindsight, those could have been moved yeah. around a little bit. That was fair. But how people reacted in terms of literally just like pure hatred uh, was like, that was mind-blowing to me. I'm like, wow, like, this is a guy who is a really good player. And you can't blame him for everything. You can blame him for some things, but not everything. And, and that was just kind of crazy to see. But I think it's just because when you are a huge personality, when you have, what is it, one million something Twitter followers, yeah. same in sport. Like, there's a lot of people who like you, and there's a lot of people who hate you, and people who hate hearing about you all the time. We have the same thing with certain sports people where we always hear about Tom Brady in, in the NFL oh, yeah, or Ronaldo and Messi in football. Like, certain points, I'm like, I'm tired of hearing about Ronaldo, and then I want to see him do poorly, so I don't have to hear about how great Ronaldo is. And I think Bjergsen is kind of the same deal now where he's been put up there and Perks might be the next one uh, very easily where we always talk about Perks, 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 Perks. There's going to be a bunch of people tired of hearing about Perks who want to see him fail and then start flaming. Yeah, there, there is for sure the sweet people. Like, I'm just waiting like... Once, maybe, uh, maybe never, maybe I will lose a split once and I'll be like, haha, you finally lost, <laughs> you, you shit had or something like that, you know, I will just get flamed by everyone. And like, not by everyone, you know, by some people who are like hiding in their cage right now and then like waiting for me to lose well, and like, then strike, you know. They're waiting. <laughs> Bottom of those Reddit threads, they're always there, negative 11 points <laughs> yep. on those comments. Perks is awful. So we know now as a broadcast and as players, if we overrate a player, which we have done definitely on, in the yeah, past, put him on that pedestal. Uh, then more people will see it and more people will react to it. And if they do not agree, if it's someone they always hear about, they might react really harsh against it, or, which is fair. Like, sometimes it is fair, sometimes it's not. Yeah, and so the last thing is we kind of, like, tail out of the Bjergsen discussion that I want to move into is, is more back on you, Perks. Um, you're not an NA, man, and you're really good. And I think a lot of people were worried you were going to leave. And you're on the leave. Euphoria podcast. Right? And you're on the EU podcast. <laughs> Let's go. But you you signed a three-year a uh, three-year deal with G2. I struggled to get that one out. Uh, talk to me. Like you're you're staying here in Europe. Obviously, we're super happy about it. But why don't you like walk us a little bit through that decision? Why are you here with us? What, what was the what was the decision making process? When I first like when I joined G2, that was actually 2015. I joined with that, like when Carlos retired. What was the name back then of the team? 
Gamers 2. There we go. <laughs> I joined Gamers 2 2015. <laughs> and uh, it was a team with Kassing and like Carlos Itar. And then like we actually lost Challenger Series qualifier to Gilius. Oof, oof. And then Gilius. Uh, I mean, it's the god. It's good and to then, be expected. And then right? Carlos bought the Gilius team. Really? Yeah. And then they were in Challenger Series and they failed. And then. I got in the lineup with Gilius and like new teammates like Jesse, Lee, Eddie Carey. Yeah, I remember like Jesse, Eddie Carey, Carey yeah. Smithy J. He won. and then like we changed half of the lineup, and then we got to LCS. So that's how it started. And meanwhile, that happened. I actually had offers from other teams, like from. Lo I remember like one funny thing was that like Rio actually wanted to roll stuff to support. I think. Okay, on HTK. Yeah, on HTK, and I would go on beat. <laughs> that, and then, <laughs> that, that was just like so, a lot. I had a lot of offers actually. Um, just when you joined LCS. Yeah, just when I, just when I qualified for LCS. Like, um, and um, we won a lot, you know? And there was times where I was not super happy or like, so, like I always wanted more, you know? I always, went, I always expected more. And Carlos always like gives more in the end, you know? He always improves. And it's not that we are like, super like we are loyal to each other but in terms of that i give my best every time and i try to give my best more and more and he does the same like he improves stuff that i need to get improved in the team like he looks to get better like make us bigger brands and um uh, just improve the team overall you know every time i needed a lineup change you know it was always there since challenger series so it's it was very like it was very natural for me to actually stay here because I, I was trying to imagine myself on other European teams or any teams and I could really not do that. Like there's some like some options, you know, in any that like could be maybe tempting, you know, but it's like there are not lineups that I would want to play in and you would always have to have at least three like North American players. And that is fine as long as you can get the best ones. But the best ones are usually seated on the best teams mm -hmm. and they will not move from there, you know. They have no reason to. So I was thinking about it in the future and there would be very low potential of me actually having a team that could do very well at Worlds or something. So, uh, and on top of all of that, I got a compass with a salary that's uh, that's pretty high and I could not like decline. So, so you're paying for lunch today. So I can I, mean, I can treat you with steak, yeah. <laughs> Wait, we can invite him on a podcast and you can make him pay for lunch. Right, hey, anyway, anyway, please continue. You stop. You please so, continue. yeah, it was just that, like, Carlos came to me with, uh, first I told him there's no way I'm signing a three-year deal. <laughs> like, no no way, bro. <laughs> and then he came to me with an offer, and then, like, we talked a bit, you know, and then we came to a deal, and... Yeah, here it is. I'm three years in Europe, guys. There you go. Cool. I mean, money's always going to be a big factor, and it's not something we obviously want to hit on a, hit on a ton, right? Because it's it's so different depending on where you are and what what yeah, team resources and like, you have. Yeah, it's like people should really not hate on EU pros living to America because yeah. the difference really is huge unless you can get a very long deal, you know. Then yeah, I mean right. the, the the deals are long in NA too, you know. So it's just like. I'm a bit lucky, I guess. Yeah, and I just, I just, the, the bigger thing for me there is just talking about the the mutual kind of respect and growth that you're both pushing for, right? Like that to me, if if I'm looking to work with anybody, like that's a huge, mm -hmm. a huge thing, right? Are we both trying to be the best that we possibly can be as we push forward? And so that's a cool uh, relationship to hear about. Now, we're getting closer to the end of the podcast. We have two segments left, gentlemen. The first one, one of my personal favorites, is the EU LCS Power Rankings. The Euphoria EU LCS Power Rankings. <clears throat> now, we have a couple options as to how we can do this. We want to rate teams 1 through 10. We can start at the bottom or we can start at the top. Work our way down, work oh, our way do up. 1 to 10 and not S, A, B. No, 1 to 10. All right. Full all right. Power Rankings. Right, okay. You don't get out with a tier list. You don't want to get all out right. with anything soft here. So is, is there any strong opinions right off the bat on who is number 1 or who is number 10? And we'll work up from there. Number one, ah, uh, everyone had to lose, right? So I guess that I mean a lot of this is gonna depend on the off-season roster changes and who we think are actually gonna be. Yeah, who do you think the best like, who team? Who do you think is know? the best team right now? Like, like even, right now, right? Yeah, like who do you actually think is the best? I, I, I don't care if Vitality is two zero. If you don't believe they're the best team, yeah, don't yeah. put them number one, right? Just but is the power rank is like for right now? For like right, right now. now, who is the best team? This right? very if, moment. If, if uh, that's team, well, like, that is so hard to say. Like, I don't know. Let's just I, pick one in first place I then. I really just have to pick something because I really... I okay, really, who's the worst right now? How about that? 
Unicorns of Love. Unicorns of Love. Okay, wow, that there was really go. easy, guys. Look at that. We started. All right, the so we're starting at the bottom. Uh, who? Who's in ninth? Who who's in ninth place? Wait, what teams are there? Uh, so like down there we have teams like down there. You uh, gotta tell them all. You gotta be. Okay, right, so all, all right. the teams we have. So just as a reminder, standings. Team Vitality first place two zero, and all these teams are one one from now on. Schalke, Fnatic, G two Esports, Giants Gaming, H two K Gaming, Misfits Gaming, Splice, Team Rocket, and the only zero two team in our tenth place team, Unicorns of Love. If we have to rate it right now, so a lot of it is based on week one. I'm actually going to say a team like Splice is down near the bottom. They did yeah. not play yeah, well yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure, in That's a few fair. weeks, they're probably going to be much better. But like, if you look at Giants and Rocket, who are some of the other teams you would talk about down there, like they showed way more to me than Splice did. Splice early game was the worst in all of EULCS. Yeah. Yes. That feels so weird to me. I, don't, I agree, but yeah. that feels weird to me to put Splice so far down. I but mean, based on the names on it, for sure, yeah. but just based on how they played in week one. Yeah. How do you feel? I mean, Splice... I, I think Splice played, like, fine from behind, at least. From behind, I agree, uh, yeah. Like, Kobe, Kobe is performing, showing up. I think the other four, not so much. Maybe Cersei, yeah, he's, he's playing well, I think, but he could... He could play better. Yeah, I think I think one problem they have is when he picks like Ivern and also the Sichuani game, he had no impact in the early game at all. And then Orana had a counter pick top with the Ilaoi, got ganked like four or five times and died. And there was no response from his team yeah. uh, or himself, right? And yeah. the other game, Niski got completely destroyed in mid lane by Caps. So the game just like the early game just fell yeah, apart. Yeah, it feels like single members collapsing exactly. consistently and so, being picked off. It is super harsh, again, with how well they actually stalled in the I late mean, game. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, think something people should remember as they listen to this, this is one week sample size yeah. here, right? So ultimately, like, it'll it's be... A, impossible to yeah, it's a very that. blurry picture. Nothing here is set. I mean, for stuff. me, it's them or H2K or Rocket are the three teams I'm looking at for ninth place right now. I mean, I... Because I think H2K got destroyed by Vitality in the, on the first day. I, they did, and they almost came back. With technical deficit, so that shows how good Vitality is or how good HK is. <laughs> sure. It's a it's a quite it's a quite a hard pickle to honestly like it's very hard to say. But I yeah, say I, that, yeah, I would say I'm okay with putting Splice ninth because I think that H2K even when they were so far behind in the first no, game. Perk says yes. Then put nine. Splice in ninth place. Oh, this can change wow. for next week. Yeah. So next up, I mean, I think we're still looking in, in the Rocket H2K. Giants, maybe a, a fair one would be would be my first thing. I said they were you know underrated, but we I rated want, them. I want tenth. Giants I, slightly higher up, just slightly higher up than eighth. I like it. All right, but then who who is who is taking eighth place here? Who is who's actually the? I team? think we take H two K. All right, put in H two K then. Re think, really yeah. bad early game against really Vitality, and obviously drafted yeah, a comp. As well. They had a cast it in vain though. Yes, they couldn't okay. do anything true, early on. True. And then they did team fight well, but they did play the well. Yeah, Sharif played well. I think. I, I think you got to put Rocket then above them. Yeah. Uh, right now, I do love the fact that Freddy has whipped these players into buying control wards. Every game, they have Wait, so yes. many control wards down. Here, here's here's my question then, because okay, so so far, just to recap, tenth place Unicorns of Love, ninth place Splice, eighth place H two K, seventh place what we're talking about right now. We'll have to be giants. Yeah, is seventh place Giants because we have uh, this is Rockhead is what you first said, but I think it I think Rockhead's controller placements and and the good the few good Barons that they showed might actually put them above Giants. But you just played against them, but they had a better late game comp, and you said you almost felt like you guys could come back and win the game. That's obviously a problem, right? Well, I mean, they they did get like they got a good Nash. Yeah. I, I, they got two good Nashers actually. They, like they, 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 like they, they, they did they did get two Nashers, but it's like. Uh, I still felt like we could win, and they were giving us opportunities. I mean, I think they played well, but just from looking at their game against Schalke, then the that game was really like like not not good to watch, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was bad. So yeah. it's just like it's fair for them to be here right yeah. now. Okay, so Rocket and seventh then, which means Giants, because I think the debate right now is we have Rocket and Giants, where we're looking at sixth and seventh, right? And it's which one do we put in which or spot? H2K above Rocket. Mm. Uh, that feels bad to me, dude. Yeah. All right, keep it like it's this. Really keep hard. it like, like this. Against G3, no? okay, again, all these are really hard. Like we're doing the one like <laughs> low like, one to ten. <laughs> all right, all right. Rocket is number one. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, I mean six and seven. You gotta put Giants on there. Yeah, Giants, Giants sixth yeah. or Giants seventh? Six. Giants sixth. Just. Give hey, they've the actually done pretty well. They have. I, I like think they played like some games. great. I'm very impressed with Joko, who felt not great on Vitality all of last yeah. summer. Had a few good games right on the Olaf pick, but. 
was really good across both games, I think, for the most part. All right, so left we have Fnatic, Misfits, Vitality, G2 Esports, and Schalke. I, I would Vitality. You put Vitality yeah, number five. I think they're... I think they're uh, Remember that D you, Deficio said that uh, Vitality was overrated. And we also talked about Fnatic being pretty overrated. Just as a reminder before we go any further. But I want Fnatic higher in this one. So. Okay. I think Vitality is like... It's... They... they s it, both games they played, mm. they didn't convince me. All right. But, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, I think that for a new team, fifth place is still pretty yeah, good pretty place good. to start. Yeah, they got like, uh, good Yeah, I was impressed by their middler and junk and the middler and A carry. Like, yeah, they, they, they came in true picks. They, they played well, yeah. All right. So, all we have left is top four. I think for number four, in my head, I'm looking at... Uh, Schalke is hard because they played without upset. I, I think it has, in my eyes, it has to be Schalke because of the substitution. Because I don't think, I think given the evidence that we've seen for everyone else, we can still believe that Schalke is a top team. Yeah. But we haven't even seen what Vander plays like as support or what their AD carry plays like. And I'm willing to concede that I think that this is a top team because I think Nukedev played fantastic, right? But at the same time... We don't know what their AD carry looks like. And even if there were struggles for Misfits and for Fnatic and even for G2, I, I just don't think you can, in good conscience, be like, this unknown quantity is by default better than... Yeah, I, I, I can agree with what you're saying, but I kind of think that Schalke is like a bit higher than that. But what you said is completely true and fair. So I mean, but who do you think... So who would you put? Would think, Misfits think, be think, fourth place? I, I mean... Or Fnatic. I mean, Fnatic lost I think uh, Obviously, he's like really good AD carries, so mm -hmm. it's... Uh, of course, you don't know how he'll perform in stage as well. You, and you obviously have different information than that. You, you've played scrims, yeah, and yeah, you yeah, have exactly. more information. I so, I mean, if you believe that he's further up, I think that's a fair argument for you to make. We're not... Ask, obviously, don't share anything, but if you think he is good and he will perform well, I think it's fair. Well, who should we put it for then? <laughs> There's I, G2 Esports, Fnatic, Misfits, and Schalke. I... Honestly, at this point, I think all four teams, like, Fnatic is the only team I don't think we can put fourth just because of how good the early game looked. Mm -hmm. And I think, I hope that the mistakes they make around Baron is something they've gone back already this week to kind of look at and, and fix. So, to me, it's between Misfits, Schalke, and G2 for fourth place. I know Perks will kill me if we put G2 fourth. I don't uh, think it's G2. Um, I think it's Misfits or Schalke is, I think, fourth place. I like Misfits games against Schalke a lot. I didn't like the game against G2 at all. I think the draft didn't help them, to be fair, yeah, uh, which made it harder. Very outdated. So I don't mind putting Schalke fourth and Misfits... Third? Third. third. Yeah, I think Schalke fourth is, is fine. Like, we don't know how, how good will upset be. Like, all right. I think that's, yeah, I think... Just based, I mean, I think obviously this list is going to change week to week, right? And I think I wouldn't be surprised. This is if week one, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Schalke shot up or shot right back down, depending on, on how upset I think they're going to go higher up when they have upset. Uh, upset too. Okay. So, uh, yeah. from what we're talking about, too, the other big one that, you know, kind of speculative was Misfits, or Misfits now are our third place team then by default. You have this look on your face like you want to put Fnatic or G2 in that spot. It's just like, I look at G2, right? And you had a good game against Misfits where you reacted well to them trying to tower dive bot lane like twice. Uh, with double TP and everything. That was good. I think Misfits draft was really hard to play. The draft was really bad. So it's very hard so, for me to judge them. Exactly. But it's also like their game against Schalke was very long. I mean... And it was but against maybe, with two subs. I mean, they it was played against, very slow because they and, didn't want to throw them down. But I think they played fine, you know. I think I don't think they played bad at all. But I just think that it's of course very hard to say because we're like it's early in the season. Yeah. But uh I mean it's 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 a hard I, top three. It's a hard top three. Top three is a mess, man. This top is this is the is hardest mess. part because I don't feel like anyone is like a clear and this is obviously the struggle of a one to ten list. No one feels like a clear number one to me. Everybody has stuff they need to work on. I mean, on. if we were gonna put like if we're gonna look just at one factor, like early game, Fnatic would be no, the best. Would be you know, and if you're gonna look at the whole team performance, then we don't even know who would be the best. So it's because of that I think G2 yeah. is the best. <laughs> he says G2 because I actually want to put Fnatic first uh, on this list, but obviously you guys they can debate that. They also lost to H2K though. But they lost, so they lost because of this like greed and lack of patience around yeah, yeah, Baron. But, but H2K is lower than Rocket, 
and we lost to Rocket and I lost to HK, so we should be the best. Oh, no, that's not how it works. That's, that's, that's how it works. Oh, you G2 first? Uh, I, just, I, I, I just feel like Fnatic's early game is really, really good. And yeah, I, I, think so too, yeah. I love how Caps is playing in the mid lane. I think he's an absolute monster right now. Unlike that G2 mid lane, I forgot his name. Oh, God. Um, where <laughs> I really feel like Fnatic will go back and be like, guys, right. let's talk about Baron right. setups, and then that will be better let for me, this let week. Let me give you my top three then, and let's see how you guys feel. Number one, Fnatic. Number two, G2. Number three, Misfits. I, I can accept that one. Because yes. here's, th here's the thing. This is the reason why I put Misfits third as opposed to second, is I think that you can blame the G2 thing on bad drafting, right? But I think they obviously they still opted into that draft. And to me, that shows that something that they were practicing was off, right? Or that they're failing to execute something that worked really well in scrims, and either way, it doesn't really look good for them, right? Mm. Also, we do have to remember... I, I have a new list. Number one, G2. Number two, Fnatic. And number three, Misfits. Like, I think that Fnatic Botland <laughs> is a lot worse than both of really? the other two Botlands, but I think Fnatic Midland, Midland mostly makes up for their weaknesses. Like, Hubs has been playing phenomenally, and, like, the... I just think the Botlan was too too bad this week. Even, even after they played the TP Sivir and, like... I think they they were just, like, both of them played horribly this mm -hmm. week. It was it was really sad to watch them, like, play like that. So, against not very good teams, you know? All right. We got to lock it in, boys. Perks is our guest, which means... No, we, we talked about this. Play. We can't yeah, do this. This hype because now we are playing as Smarty this week, so... Yeah, I know, and that's if for G2, next week's list. I put G2 first... And Fnatic gets to prove me wrong. And if I put Fnatic first, then... All right, you know what? Because you're playing Fnatic this week and because you are a guest, and we apparently are allowing concessions because our guests... I just mean, like, we're going to say... Yeah, I'm going to put Fnatic first. They also snug a Baron, which was really good uh, in the first game you're they played. You're putting Fnatic first. I'm putting Fnatic first, but G2... I, I agreed. Perks I'm wants sorry. G2. Oh, so we're two no, versus we, one. Yeah, we're two versus one -ing. You lose. Tom. Well, that's fine. Uh, you guys You guys get, like... Caster bias. You know, okay. There it is. There Caster it is. bias, right? right. right. Fnatic. Right. 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 And so now we go to the most overhyped team on the slate. Fnatic. <laughs> we, we have come right, the whole you circle. Call. You call them overhyped, yeah. you get a chance to back it up this weekend. But first, all right, so our final League of Legends power ranking. Uh, we'll do reverse order. Tenth place, Unicorns of Love. Ninth place is Splice. Eighth place is H2K. Seventh place is Rocket. Sixth place is Giants. Fifth place is Vitality. Fourth place is Shaka No Fear. Third place is Misfits Gaming. Second is G2. And first is Fnatic. And reminder, we will update this weekly with our guest. Yeah. Every time. So, who's ever playing will always be first, according to Deficio's rules. Who's ever our guest will no, always I was be first. No, I didn't think about the 2v1 we had right here, where... It's how democracy works, baby. That's true. That's true. Man, I can't wait for Fnatic to beat G2 this week, well, so we okay, can be like, you know what? Yeah, you know what? Right. <laughs> Look, I, Hold on, you have a chance. Actually, if you guys, if G2 wins against Fnatic, you guys have to say on broadcast that I was right. And, okay. if, and if G2 loses, if we lose against Fnatic, I will say somewhere in public that the, fish, the, double, D, the, the double D was right. Yeah, there we <laughs> go. I like we'll, that. we'll make sure we either get an interview with you or you can say it in a press interview either way. Or on Twitter. This, is, say it on Twitter. this is, yeah, we'll say it on Twitter then. That or is the formal, nice formal agreement. Yeah. If you take down Fnatic... In the final game of this week, Deficio and I will admit that we were wrong and that G2 should have been first place. Mm. Otherwise, you have to admit the opposite, right? That yes. we were right yes. and that Fnatic should have been yes. first place. There it is. There's our first that, bet. That's fair. Good. We okay. Bets. Well, now we get to go into the final section of the show, which is quick fire predictions. Now, how this is going to work is I'm going to go through the matches of the week, and I'm just going to give you very little notice. I'm going to say the name, and I'm going to say go. And ideally, immediately, you will tell me who you think is going to win. At the same time. At the okay. same time. Uh, at the end, we might talk about one of the matches specifically, a little bit more in-depth, see which one is the most interesting, where you guys do disagree. And otherwise, we're going to hold you accountable to these predictions in the weeks to come. Track so them all the way through, man. I'm going to hand you this sheet here, Perks, so you can look at the matches. And so we are going to start with Giants versus G2. Go. G2. G2. Okay, that's pretty easy. Splice versus Rocket. Splice. Rocket. Oh my god, all right. Misfits versus H2K. Misfits. Misfits. All right, that's easy. Fnatic versus Vitality. Fnatic. Vitality. Oh, Ooh. you took Vitality over there. <laughs> Damn, boy. All right. Fifth match, final down on Friday. Shaka No Fear versus Unicorns of Love. Shaka, Shaka No Fear. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. That one's pretty. H2K versus Giants. H2K. H2K. 
Wait, you both rated giants above them. <laughs> but now, it's been a week of spins. <laughs> you both? Was yeah. our power rankings yeah. alive? Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's zero two now. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, just don't be consistent at all. Unicorns of Love versus Rockheads. Rockheads. Okay. Next up is Vitality versus Misfits. Misfits. Oh, Misfits. Oh, I really want to think. No, no, it's Misfits. 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 Spice versus Shalka. Shalka and Fear. Oh, there you go. There we go. Two Shalka. Skin the Null Fear in there. Oh, you ready for that? Final one. Fanatic versus G2. G2. Fanatic. Oh! <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about Fanatic versus G2. As exciting as the Misfits versus. Wait, which one was it that you guys. This is, we had Fanatic the, Vitality. Yeah, he had Vitality. Perks voted well, Vitality. Yeah, I, need, I need like a 30 second explanation on why Vitality wins that game. Uh, that was mostly just the hit. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> like, I just wanted to like, co like contradict you. <laughs> so, so I, 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 mean, I have a theory how fun it wins this game. Okay. Gilius. Gilius takes Ninoli. Oh. He invades Broxa. He takes his camps. He. He heals his AD carry and his AD carry carries. He heals his AD carry and yeah. he carries. He presses yeah. E. The Athenes there of Holy go. Grail in Italy will The return. Ardent Sense in Italy is back. Yeah. Maybe not. But. Maybe, maybe not. That's well, the theory. Not, All right, like, if it happens, we're not going to make a bet here. I mean, I can so see Mini Trubex carry this game. I think he's pretty good. All right. Oh, I don't want to dwell too much on that one. Let's move forward. You guys had a couple of disagreements, actually. But let's go to the last one. Fnatic versus G2. So Perks, you're pretty you're pretty adamant that you deserve first place in the power rankings, that you're gonna take down G2. So so why do you think Fnatic? Or yeah, that you're gonna take down Fnatic. <laughs> yeah. You're not gonna beat your own team. <laughs> Hopefully. Don't do it. All right. Uh so tell me what what's it what what's the plan here? How how what how do you exploit Fnatic? How do you how do you beat Fnatic? Well, don't share too I much. I mean, yeah, don't share too much. Yeah. Like I think we just uh like we, I just need to control the mid lane, and then it should be an easy game from then onwards because Cups is their strongest point, and the rest of the members like actually saw us perform quite well. But mm -hmm. I think that my sidelines are better than their sidelines, and in terms of like how teams play, I think their early game as a team is probably better than our early game as of right now. But I think that our strong, stronger laning, maybe meta understanding, can be can have an upper hand on them. And if we can keep improving during the next three days of streams, then uh, we should be able to take them down. Youngbug is in your head, man. He knows everything about you. Is that Caps your theory? I was gonna say that you just we spent most of this show whenever Caps came up at all. You're like Caps is playing really good right now. That's yeah, what you said is. every time. Yeah, so I'm, so you feel confident that you can actually take this guy? Is he playing really good but not at the perks level? Like what what level was Caps actually playing at? Right well, now? I think like every time I played against Caps in the early season, I got kind of uh, like a uh, shit on, I guess. <laughs> but every time That's I played uh, every time and every time I played against him at the end of the season, I was I always I felt like I performed better than him in spring and summer. So uh I think that this time around, I'm a lot more prepared for the early season strike. Ooh. And I think that like, I will <laughs> hopefully not get outplayed by Cubs. So that's why I said I just have to control it right now. I have to control the million. And when this later season comes, I will just like completely destroy him. But as of right now, uh, I think he's performing very, very well. And yeah, like I don't think that I... I think I can perform a little better than what I am right now. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not like... I'm not super confident in my own ability. Uh, as of like out outperforming him, but if I can like perform uh, as well, then it should be fine. Okay, and mm. is, are you now convinced, Deficio, or do you would you change your prediction to G two? I mean, the only way I mean I could just say that I think Caps is going to do better than Perks, right? And then instantly his entire thing kind of falls down because it was about <laughs> him controlling mid lane. But uh, I think Fnatic's early game is going to be better. Uh, I definitely uh, I like how Source is playing. I don't think the bot lane is playing that bad. In the early game, I think in team fights, Reckless played really poorly in week one, and so did Hill saying. But I think Fnatic is going to win the early game. Um, Brox is going to be super active in terms of ganks. I think Caps and Perks is, is actually dead even at the moment in terms of just individual ability, and it comes down to probably the picks. But I can see Source get an early lead through Broxa into play around bot side, secure bot lane tower, because they're going to play like pushing Sivir with TP. And I am putting. All my faith in that Fnatic will have researched what went wrong around the Baron, how to work on it, 
Otherwise, it's going to be a messy late game with constant team fighting and back and forths where both teams can technically take it. But I'm going to say Fnatic will have done that better. And because they win the early game, and because Caps will be 10-0 after laning phase, oh, what? And now spinning we're on Perks' dead oh. body, <laughs> Fnatic will win. All right, well, you can find out for yourself this weekend, EULCS, the 26th and the 27th. That game is the fifth game on Saturday, the 27th. The big one. Fnatic versus G2. Until then, uh, thank you, Perks, for joining us on the first episode of Euphoria. Thank you guys for having me. Notice how on this paper, the outro, Drake is in order to remember, I actually wrote, Thank the guests and say goodbye. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you for the spoiler, Deficio. Now, this is the final portion of the podcast. Goodbye, everyone, and thanks for listening.